good morning to all of you uh, as we start our third day's lectures. Uh, today uh, the plan is to uh, complete uh, the electrostatics in the morning and uh, do a lecture on magnetostatics in the afternoon. The reason why we spent so much of time on electrostatics uh, though planning to spend only one lecture on magnetostatics is because the electrostatics uh, essentially establishes all the principles that we want. Uh, the magnetostatics almost goes parallel, so therefore there is uh, minor cosmetic changes that we have to make as we go along. Like uh, yesterday, uh, we start our uh, session uh, taking up the questions which came on the chat session which we could not take up. Uh, we still seem to be getting a lot of questions on uh, the meaning of curl, divergence, solenoidal, irrotational. Uh, see the point is that uh, I have to also proceed with physics and um, one thing I would like to point out, please understand these are mathematical techniques. I have been asked questions like give an example of where it is used in communication engineering. The point is this that th this is really not a very relevant question because uh, tools of vector calculus are used in any subject which uses mathematics. It does not have to be specific to a particular area. Since I am not a communication engineer, I will not be able to tell you, okay, look at this theorem where uh, it is useful. But supposing ask this question of thermodynamics or other areas of uh, physics, electrical engineering, etc., maybe I would have been able to give it. But basically, uh, the mathematical tools, uh, they should be taken up as tools and uh, uh, even this question which keeps on coming that what is the meaning of the curl, why it is so called. See, you have to realize that definitions or nomenclatures like curl, solenoidal, irrotational, etc. came from the uh, topic where the vector calculus was used in detail and that is actually the subject of fluid dynamics. And so therefore, the word curl as you know that when you curl your finger like this, which means something which is having a rotatory motion. So in case of vector what we say is the direction of the vector is changing. So that is how the name you know curl came from and it is irrotational because uh, the idea is that uh, the if curl is equal to 0, it means it does not rotate, it does not curl. So that is the whole idea. Uh, but as I said, uh, these are historical uh, introductions and there is not much physics uh, in nomenclatures and things like that. Same goes about solenoidal. So I will not be really spending much of a time on re-explaining or revisiting the questions on vector calculus. Uh, what I take up today, first a question which is asked by uh, Tyagaraja College of Engineering Madurai, uh, Center 1173. The question was asked that what is the difference between potential and potential energy? In fact, somebody said supposing instead of taking a unit charge, I take a charge Q, will it become potential energy? The, I think because it is a thing which uh, confuses a lot of students. Uh, let me explain to you so that uh, you have no doubt that we are talking about two different things. Historically, the name potential is unfortunate, but once the name was given, we have to stick to it. There is a relationship with potential energy, but they are two distinct things. So, let me try to explain the difference between potential and potential energy in a little clear way. The best way to explain this is to look at what happens in gravitational field. As you know that a gravitational field is very much like uh, uh, electrostatic field, it is a conservative field. Of course, uh, the gravitational forces between mass is always attractive, whereas the in case of uh, charges they could be attractive or repulsive depending upon uh, the charges. Let us look at the difference between gravitational potential energy and gravitational potential. And if you try to understand what I am trying to talk about here, then you will have no problem even in understanding. First, first let us assume that I am in this room and uh, where uh, let us say gravity is constant. So, gravity G is constant, you usually take it to be 9.81 uh, meter per second square and the direction of gravity is downwards. This is your gravity. Now, I am just saying that suppose 
I have a particle which is at a height h. This, this, these things are very well known to you or also to your students. And let us say the mass of the particle is m. Now, we say the potential energy of this mass because the force is constant is given by m g times h. This is the potential energy. Now, notice that the uh, force of gravity is m g. However, it is downwards. So, let me I can write this as uh, the magnitude of the force of gravity multiplied by h. Now, how do I understand this? See, the idea is this that supposing I started with the floor of the house where I take the reference of the potential energy to be 0. Supposing I say that this is potential energy is equal to 0. Then if I, I meaning an external agency, if I want to take this mass to from ground to the height h, I have to uh, provide a force in, in a direction opposite to that of gravity. And let us suppose I just give it a slightly uh, uh, you know uh, bigger force and um, so that the mass moves to a height h with a you know constant velocity, constant speed. Now then this particle comes here. Now what does it mean that it has a potential energy mgh? What it means is supposing you leave it, leave this mass at this point, then the mass will of course fall down converting continuously the potential energy into kinetic energy and when it falls onto the floor all its potential energy has been converted into a kinetic energy. Now, so in other words the potential energy is the amount of energy that is stored in this mass by virtue of the fact that a work has been done by an external agency against gravity which is the prevailing force. Now, let us look at what would happen suppose I talk about the corresponding electrostatic phenomena. The, the how do I produce a constant electric field? I mean it is not difficult, I at least not difficult to imagine. So, let me take an infinite charged plane, uh, let us say positively charged and look at above it, I know that the field is uniform. So, supposing I have a positive charge I, which I take from here to uh, this point. Now, notice that since this charge plane is positive, the charge that I have is also positive, the, there is a repulsive force between them. So, therefore, in principle this would actually just go up, but let us look at supposing the charge is already here at a height h and then I want to bring it down. Now, if I want to bring it down, I have to do work against the, at the repulsive force of this charge plane and exactly when I bring it down supposing this was my reference point of zero potential energy then I would get uh, a, the, the same principle as there. Now identical statement you can make for let us say the uh, electrostatic potential energy due to a charge q supposing there is a particle at a point a. Now uh, let me also for convenience take both of them to be um, uh, charged similarly positive or negative. And so, let this distance ra along the radial distance be r a and suppose I want to move this charge uh, q to a position r b. Now, the way to do it is this remember the gravity always acts along the line joining the two particles. So, but what I can do first is to okay, let me draw a uh, radial line here. Now, what I do first is move from here in a transverse direction like this and since at every point on its path the electrostatic force is perpendicular to the uh, direction of motion the work done is 0 on this path. On the other hand I can come from here to there I will do work because I will be working against the direction of gravity and you can sort of work out that the amount of work done by the external agency. that would be q q the integration is trivial by 4 pi epsilon 0 1 over r b minus 1 over r a. And this would then be the potential energy 
that is stored. Work has been done by an external agency, the energy has increased, so that is stored as the potential energy. Now, the question is, in what is the meaning of the word potential? I told you that potential is a point function. Now, suppose potential is a point function, which is actually a scalar field. So, supposing I have a charge Q here, capital Q. Now, all around it is a seat of electric field and every point has a potential, whether there is a charge small q there or not. This is the basic question. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is the following. Suppose you define your zero of the potential somewhere conveniently. In this example, I will take the zero of the potential phi is equal to zero at infinite distances. Now, in that case, the potential energy, the potential energy, now this is very important, that a unit charge would have if it is located there. Now, what is, what is the difference? The difference is potential energy is an energy, potential is its basic uh, capability. That is, if you put a charge, one unit of charge there, the potential and the potential energy expression wise will be the same. If you put a charge Q there, it would be the potential multiplied by Q. If you put a charge 2 q there, it will be a potential multiplied by 2 q. In other words, the potential has nothing to do with how much charge is there, what is the charge, unit charge, 10 units of charge, 20 units of charge, but potential is a property of that point. In the pre presence of q, the potential is the property of that point. You put a charge q there, it will have that much of potential. So, in other words, the one is the capability that if you go somewhere, it would happen. The, so, let me give you a crude example. Supposing I say that there is a there is a fireplace in my room. Now, if I go to that fireplace, I will feel it hot. But property of that point that there is a fire point there, the temperature is high there that has nothing to do with whether I am there or not. It is a property of the space, it is a property of a point in the space. So, one is a capability, the other one is an actual value. Supposing you have a wallet or a purse. Now, I can say wallet or that purse is the place where you can keep money, but on the other hand the money does not have to be there. So, please understand there is a difference between the word potential, which is a point function, which is a property of a point and it is related to potential energy because if you were to put a charge Q there, then the potential energy that charge would have is Q times the potential. So, that is about the potential and the potential energy. The next uh, question uh, is um, more in the nature of clarity, uh, there is question asked by 1092 KIT College Kolhapur. Uh, question was that um, the discussion of boundary conditions was not uh, clear enough. So, can you explain the boundary conditions little better? Uh, I will come back to boundary conditions later also, but since the question has been asked that uh, let me let me first give you an example. Um, you all know uh, because light uh, is something which you have been learning from uh, the beginning. That suppose I have a medium, I have an interface between two medium. For, for example, there is glass here, 
and uh, and there is a block of glass here and there is light there is air here so this is medium number 1 is air and medium number 2 is let's say glass now what happens to a ray of light which falls here now the point is that when a ray of light falls at the interface between two medium certain continuity condition has to be satisfied this is uh, maybe i will come to it when i discuss the optics the you know that of course ray ray optics wise the incident angle must be equal to the angle of uh, reflection and the uh, there would be a refraction which will depend upon uh, the snell's law but what happens here is that there is a question of continuity of the electric field associated with light so boundary conditions are conditions that must be met when uh, we talk about the um, what happens at the interface between two media in this example that i gave you is the interface between glass and air now what we were trying to say yesterday is this that suppose i consider the electric field uh, let us say generated by a charged plane. Supposing this is a charged plane, let us assume it is also positively charged. Now, what we said is this that if there is a charged surface, notice this is a good example of a boundary function you know that the electric field here of course the above the plane and below the plane they are constant but for example this is directed that way so let's call this e above the electric field below the plane is directed that way let's call it e below so you notice immediately that there is a discontinuity in this case the there is a electric field which is directed above there is the electric field which is directed below. So, you can subtract one from the other and say that there is a discontinuity in the electric field. The electric field is not continuous. Now, the way to look at it is the following. Suppose I define E perpendicular, this is a perpendicular component of the electric E perpendicular above and E perpendicular below, I take both of them with the same sense. In other words, supposing this has been taken this way, this will be taken that way. You will say how? Well, that is not very important. You just put in a minus sign there. That is not very important. So, now what we said is this, that the fact that there is a charge surface there, it tells me that there is a difference between E perpendicular above and E perpendicular below and that is equal to the surface, surface charge density sigma divided by epsilon 0. Now, this is a discontinuity this is a discontinuity with this sense the reason was of course that your direction of n is above here direction of n is below on that surface and so this is your discontinuity so whenever i am talking about an electric field and if the electric field is looked at the interface between two medium later on when we talk about dielectric we will point this out little more carefully that then the perpendicular component of the electric field is continuous. However, if you compare the parallel fields component E per parallel above, it turns out to be continuous which is equal to E parallel below. Now, look at it this way. You know that the since electric field is a conservative field, your E dot dl is equal to 0. Now, this tells me that suppose I am to look at a uh, the potential. Now, you see potential difference between the point B and point A that is nothing but minus integral from A to B E dot d L. Now, since the point A and B are very close one just above the charge and the other below the charge this integral goes to 0 when the distance between A and B becomes negligible. So, therefore, it tells me though the normal component of the electric field is discontinuous the potential remains continuous uh, 
Okay, there are quick questions on uh, uh, what is this earth connected and earth bounded? See, um, or grounded. See, so you have to realize that um, the earth is a huge reservoir. It can absorb any amount of charge and it can uh, release any amount of charge. So, basically a proper earth connection because it is an infinite reservoir is because the earth is at zero potential. So, therefore, we use in electrostatics the uh, grounding is the same as talking about that for example, yesterday I gave an example in method of images that the lower plate was grounded and I use the fact that the potential of the lower plate is 0. This is used synonymously. However, uh, in real grounding uh, when you want to do real earth connection if you like. Now, if there is a significant resistance then uh, the 0 potential may not actually be true, but you notice that grounding is not necessarily connected that language is not necessarily connected with earth. Um, even in for example, your mobile phone or other handheld device. Now, you would find uh, a there is a large conductor which is attached to one side of your power supply. So, that is the uh, place to which the all uh, return paths of various uh, currents uh, coming from different uh, components come. Uh, this is usually come by the called by electrical engineers as common. So, basically it, it serves the same thing that uh, it, it provides the presence of a reservoir with fairly large um, you know capability. So, that uh, it can be re regarded as a reference potential. The last question that I take up is um, it actually came I think by an email from somebody and this was a question connected with Laplace's equation and I said uh, something about the Laplace's equation which is del square phi is equal to 0 and I said that um, it shows saddle point. The question uh, was raised that when my second derivative is 0, uh, I normally talk about it as a, a local or a global maximum depending upon what the condition is. Now, the uh, you know what in what connection I am calling about uh, a saddle point. Now, I have to sort of tell you that derivative equal to 0 second derivative uh, greater than 0 is a minimum, second derivative less than 0 is a maximum and these are strictly one dimensional observation. But supposing I go to higher dimension, supposing I go to even two dimension. Now, in that case I can define my local minimum Now, a point a b is a local minimum provided if I am looking at some region around the point a b. Uh, if around point a b, if I look at an arbitrary point x y, then the value of the function at such a point x y remains greater than uh, f of a b and this is uh, in a region around the point a b. Now, this does not have, have to be a uh, global maximum or a minimum. For example, you look at this type of a thing. Say so, this is a minimum, this is a local minimum, but, but this is not obviously a global minimum because there are other points which are lower than that. Now, what happens in two dimension okay, is you look at a different quantity which is d which is defined as uh, f x x uh, f y y minus f x y square, where f x x means d square f over d x square and f x y means d square f over d x d y. Now, depending upon the value of this f, I have various types of things. For example, uh, if I say that d is greater than 0, then my f x x 
being greater than 0 gives me one of the local minima d less than 0 okay and uh, f f x x less than 0 gives me a local uh, maximum but d uh, sorry d greater than 0 in both cases d less than 0 gives me a saddle. Now, if d is equal to 0 then I need still higher order derivatives, but you know this is multivariable calculus if I continue with it it will take a very long time. So, please look up some standard calculus uh, books. With this we complete uh, the questions that I received yesterday. If your question has not been answered either you will receive an email with an answer or uh, it means that uh, this question has already been answered you are repeating that question and uh, I will in that case please look up uh, the any standard textbook. With this let me uh, start today's balance lecture on uh, electrostatics. Uh, end of the session today uh, if I am left with time I will uh, come back to Laplace's equation which yesterday I could not do because of shortage of time. So, I was talking to you about method of images. Now, first let me tell you that where did this method of images come from? The method of images came from a general statement that I proved yesterday which is called the uniqueness theorem. Now, this is a very important theorem in electrostatics. The uniqueness theorem tells me that if I am trying to solve Laplace's equation in a region of space and suppose in that region there are uh, boundary conditions given to me. For example, supposing I am solving a general potential problem in this room and then there is a conductor in this room, I know that whatever is my solution, the solution must be such that when I come to the conductor my potential must remain constant. That is a boundary condition. The no matter how you solve it, you have to you could so be solving an actual differential equation corresponding to a real problem in electrostatics that you have. But your solution must satisfy the boundary conditions. Now, the uh, uniqueness theorem was in some sense unique because it told us that once you have given Laplace's equation, in fact the statement can be made even for Poisson's equation given Poisson's equation for a given charge density. In Laplace's equation of course, you do not provide a charge density del square phi equal to 0. Now, if you have del square phi equal to 0 and you have been given conditions. Now, I talked about two types of conditions there. One I call as the Dirichlet condition. The Dirichlet condition is like what happens on a conductor. For example, it tells me that at certain point the potential values are specified. The other possible condition is called a Neumann condition is uh, that instead of specifying the potential we specify the normal derivative of the potential which is nothing but basically the electric field component. Now, if this is given the uniqueness theorem tells me that solution is unique. What do I mean by solution is unique? It means that if you take two solutions phi 1 and phi 2 or psi 1 and psi 2, then these two solutions can at, at best differ by a constant. The constant different does not make any difference to a uh, potential. So, this is uniqueness theorem. Coming out of that uniqueness theorem, one of the answers is something like this that if you have by some means you have a method of guessing a solution. If you have a, if you have guessed a solution, then since the solution can only be unique, your solution that you have guessed must be the same solution. Now, you see this is not a very unusual statement. Let me first tell you um, in connection with um, for instance, uh, the um, you know uh, for those you, of you who are mathematically oriented, you know that if you are given a very large number. And if you are asked to find out factors, now if the factors are very big also, then it is not a very easy job to find out a factor because uh, one does not have very efficient 
algorithms, meaning thereby as computer scientists will tell you, there are no polynomial time algor algorithms, standard algorithm, there are theories okay, which will be enable you to factorize a number. But suppose you are a bright person and you say okay, I have seen this number and I believe that this is a factor. Now, how you got it, I do not know, maybe you dreamt it. But supposing you dreamt it, now all that you need to do is now do a division. Take the original number, take, take the number you dreamt and divide it. And if you find there is no remainder, then of course your guess was right. Now, if your guess is right, and that solution then has to be correct, it is a unique solution. Now, it is not true that if another person dreams of the same number and he divides it, he will not he will find a remainder. Okay. So, in method of images, we actually use our intuition. So, what I, I did is this, I said supposing I have a conductor which is grounded that, it is in that connection that the grounding question came up. Uh, I meant supposing I have a body which is kept at zero potential, this is one of the smartest way of uh, providing a zero potential, very large conductor which is grounded. Now, so I have a charge Q and a conductor. So, I need to find out what is the potential due to this charge anywhere in this space. But my solutions must have the property that when I come take this expression, come to the surface of the conductor, then the value of my potential must become 0. Now, I will now say that look, let me try to guess a solution. So, what I did is to say that imagine, now this is this language is borrowed from optics, that imagine there is a charge q prime behind the plane. What is meant by behind the plane? It is a virtual world. Remember when you are sp standing in front of a mirror, the image is not is there. You say that it is at a distance uh, d behind the mirror, but you cannot tape, take a tape and measure it because it is in a virtual world there. So, in that sense, I have said that let there be a charge q prime located at a distance d prime behind the plane. Now, what I now do is this, I say alright, now let us calculate the potential due to q and q prime at a point p. Okay? Now, these are very standard expression. Uh, I have taken the z axis along the line joining q and q prime and this distance is d along the z direction, this distance is d prime along the z direction minus d prime. So, my potential at the point p by superposition principle is q 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 r 1, which is uh, in the denominator square root of x square plus y square okay, plus z minus d whole square okay. and phi 2 is q prime by this, this equal to this. So, what is my total potential? My total potential by superposition principle is the sum of these two. So, this is my total potential and now I say that supposing I take the grounded plane itself. Okay? Supposing I look at only the point z is equal to 0, that is the grounded plane. If I put z is equal to 0 in this expression, this becomes q by 4 pi epsilon 0 x square plus y square plus d square and this becomes q prime by x square plus y square plus d prime square. So, I have this plus this that must be equal to 0. Now, I, I need to satisfy that. Now, what is the best way I can satisfy this? I will say that look, this has been done by squaring it up, but does not matter. So, what I do is this that look, one of the ways to satisfy this is to let q prime be equal to minus q, d prime be equal to d. Now, so therefore, my image charge has the same magnitude as my real charge. The image charge must be located at a distance d behind the conductor, identical to what happens in case of an image and that is why the name came up. Now, if you do that, then this combination of two charges satisfies Laplace's equation because phi 1 satisfies Laplace's equation, phi 2 satisfies Laplace's equation. So, therefore, remember the solution is only in the region above the uh, plane. So, since phi 1 and phi 2 both satisfy Laplace's equation, phi 1 plus phi 2 will also satisfy Laplace's equation. Now, we have also shown that if you choose q prime equal to minus q and d prime is equal to minus d then the potential is 0 on the surface. In other words, Laplace's this new problem that I have got, 
it satisfies Laplace's equation this region, satisfies the condition that there is on the conductor the potential is equal to 0. By uniqueness theorem, the solution is unique. So, that must be the only solution. Let me continue with by giving another example. Okay. So, this I sort of told you that you can uh, now use this expression for potential to calculate the charge density and this is just a plot of the charge density on Mathematica and you find that uh, charge density that is induced obviously negative is uh, very uh, large magnitude uh, just points directly opposite to the uh, real charge and sort of spreads out around. But, but these are uh, problems which if you ask your students they are uh, all more proficient in computers than many of us are they will be able to draw it without any problem. Now, another thing which I am not really sort of showing that if you wanted to calculate the force between the charge Q and uh, remember that there is a induced charge on the uh, plane and so you could uh, since the induced charge is uh, negative uh, if this is a positive charge there is a force of attraction between uh, the uh, uh, plane and the positive charge. Now, this uh, one can show is exactly equal to the force of attraction between this charge and the image charge which is much easier to calculate. Let me take uh, another uh, example where again method, method of images is used the solution is slightly uh, more difficult. So, let me explain that. So, I have taken this time a spherical conductor. In fact, this was one of the question that was asked that if uh, the uh, conductor is a sphere will the charge be on the surface? The answer is yes, but I did not take up that question for the simple reason that I was going to do it here in detail. So, the point is this that I have a spherical conductor which is grounded. Again by grounded I mean that it is uh, kept at 0 potential. Incidentally, uh, you can use this method of images, uh, it does not have to be always grounded, you can maintain it at constant potential. Um, so, these are all possibilities and, and but I am of course, able to illustrate only those which are reasonably simple. So, suppose I have a charge Q at a distance A from the center of this sphere. Now, uh, I am interested in calculating what is the field at a point P, which is the region I consider is outside the sphere. So, let us suppose this distance is R1. Now, without doing anything, I say that all right, uh, let me put a image charge Q prime. Now, somewhere inside the sphere because it has to be in the virtual world. So, essentially what I have done is to uh, take that along the line joining the center and this and suppose the distance from the point P is R2, the coordinates of point P itself uh, with respect to the center of the sphere is R theta phi and so therefore, let this distance be equal to B. Now, let us look at this uh, problem. Uh, my total potential is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q by r 1. Remember phi 1 satisfies Laplace's equation. Phi 2 is q prime by r 2, r 2 uh, which I have written as b should have been little more. Uh, okay. The r 2 is this distance from q prime to p, r 1 is q to p. So, this is the net potential. Phi 1 and phi 2 satisfy Laplace's equation. So, phi also satisfies Laplace's equation. Now, only we have to satisfy the boundary condition on the surface of the sphere, but let us look at what is R 1. My R 1 by triangle equality is A square plus R square minus 2 A R cos theta. So, this is what it is. Okay. Now, what about uh, R 2? R 2 is this. So, this is equal to this square plus this square that is B square plus R square minus 2 B R cos theta. So, this is my phi. Now, I want I want that this plus this, when small r becomes equal to capital R for any angle because I am on the surface of the sphere, put small r equal to capital R for any angle this plus this must be equal to 0. So, what is the condition I get? So, I have written down this plus this is equal to 0, square them this is very trivial algebra okay? and try to see what should be the relationship between Q remember this relationship has to be true for all theta, all theta this is very important. 
So, therefore, the first thing that you do is because this relationship has to be true for all theta, I must have that b by a okay, must be equal to q prime by q and that is equal to minus square root of b by a. So, you do that and what you find is that your charge ratio of the charge uh, q prime must be equal to minus r by a multiplied by q. It is a negative charge, but unlike the plane uh, uh, conducting plane case, it is not equal and opposite to that charge that you have put in. There is a there is a ratio there. Now, you would say then why call it mirror? Well, you see the point is that object distance equal to image distance as you know is true for, for plane mirrors. That is not true for spherical mirrors for instance. So, there is no one to one correspondence, but what we are saying is that if at a distance b given by r square by a, this point is actually called the point of inversion. If you put a charge q prime equal to minus r by a times q, then again the potential on the sphere at any point would be equal to 0, which means that once again I have solved the Laplace's equation subject to a given boundary condition. So, this is method of images. I repeat again method of images draws its power from uh, the uniqueness theorem which says if you want to solve either Laplace's equation or Poisson's equation, then for a given charge density of Poisson's equation and for Laplace's equation, if you are given boundary conditions in the nature of potential and in the nature of the normal component of the electric field, then the solution is unique. There are some quick questions if I can take up, uh, three questions coming up if there are clarifications, uh, we will first is from Motilal Nehru College Institute. Yes, sir, my question is what is the speciality of using method of images to find the potential? Yeah. We can also find out it by using conventional method. So, what is the speciality? Okay, so let, let me explain. The, the point actually is that you know that what we are trying to do is basically to solve differential equations, multivariable differential equation because it is a del square of phi that is given subject to boundary conditions. Now, if you have solved differential equations, you are given an ordinary you know either ordinary or partial differential equation subject to boundary conditions, you must have realized how much of labor it involves most of the time that you do not unless you have differential equations of very special type, you do not have special prescription for solving differential equation. Most of the time today, the you will find people use computer packages for solving differential equation and of course, lot of effort has gone into this. I am not saying that uh, method of images gives you a way in which for example, have an integrating factor multiply and do it. That is not what we are talking about. We are saying in some problems where your intuition can play a role, like supposing you are given a differential equation. Now, if instead of trying to solve it uh, by multiplying a integrating factor using a package and solving it, supposing you have a great intuition that look I can look at what the solution could be look, looking like then obviously, you will not be spending time on solving that differential equation completely. So, method of images provides you a very convenient and a quick way of getting into and checking that there is a solution. Now, you check that there is a solution, then you do not have to go any further, because we have proved that any solution that you have guessed, if you put it back into the equation and say that it is satisfying the boundary condition, that must be unique solution. So, therefore, when you said that what is the way, let me let me explain what is it, what it means. Supposing I asked you that what are the factors of 105. Now, you could sit down, start using an Euler program uh, for factorizing, but many of your friends will say 105 last digit is 5, so 5 must be a factor. So, you understand what I am trying to say. What did you go do here? 5 is a factor indeed, you went by intuition. Now, is it any less rigorous, but how much of time did you save on that? So, what I am trying to tell you is the method of images is not a method which can be applied in all cases, but there are certain cases where a particularly physicists would love to use their intuition rather than 
trying to say that okay, let me spend next one hour and doing the factorization. Right? See, of course, 105 is a trivial example, but I could give you a much bigger number. I, for instance, I give you a huge number. Now, but a school child will say, all right, let me add up all the digits. Okay? Now, I add up all the digits and find that whatever sum I got is divisible by 9. Now, what, do you, what can you conclude out of it? If sum of the digits is divisible by 9, you take a 20 digit fact number, I am sure somebody knows the answer there. What does it mean? That number is divisible by 9, it is intuition. Are you going to do the factor of that number? The answer is no. I know, I, I will immediately test it. Thank you. Next, MGM college, yes. Sir, uh, for the conductor, uh, the distance is B is equal to R square by B, you have, according to you, and yeah. Q dash is equal to minus Q R into A. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I, I, and I, uh, for the plane, uh, Q is equal to minus Q and D is equal to D dash. Yes. So, so if I apply this law for the non-conducting, there is a difference or uh, same? Okay, good question actually. They, if you took a non-conducting surface, then of course the potential does not have to be kept constant. You see a conductor maintains the surface at the constant potential. So, all that I am saying is, can you give me a surface where the potential is specified? Now, if you give me a non-conductor, then of course you cannot say potential is constant. You will then have to give me the complete potential distribution on the surface of that non-conductor. Now, if you can do that, then technically the solution by method of image is the same, but it will not be an easy problem to solve. In which case you will probably not try to solve it by method of images. They are usually done for conductors because I can easily keep the potential constant. Thank you. Yeah, any more? Uh, finding the um, non-conducting like this, any formula? Yeah, no, not by method of images. Of course, there are, say the basically, you can always find a potential, Dep you know I mean we have you, have, you have done such calculations. See analytical calculations are easy only if the problem have sufficient symmetry. The Coulomb's law or the expression for the potential is usually for multi-particle system is usually so complicated that if you want to find out how much is the potential, you usually have to take recourse to a computer program. But Analytical methods are very difficult. So, uh, method of images provides you an analytical method and of course, it is applicable only for very specific and uh, simple cases. Uh, I will stop uh, this uh, uh, question here because the questions are piling up and since this is met questions are on method of images, please uh, uh, send the questions tomorrow, tomorrow first thing in the morning I will take it up. Okay. So, so far we have been talking about conductors. Okay. What are conductors? Conductors are basically uh, material where there are free charge carriers and which can flow when an electric field is applied. But a large class of material, they are actually non-conductors. In a non-conductor, the electrons are tightly bound to the atoms of the molecules to which they belong. And, and because of that, that because they are bound to, they do, they do not have much of a mobility. That is why they are called bound charges. Now, suppose in a non-conductor, we apply an electric field. Then, you see a typical um, charge neutral uh, non-conductor, there the charge center for the uh, positive charge and the negative charge, they coincide. I mean, this is uh, many, many classes of materials are like that. They are electrically neutral. And sometimes, if you apply an electric field, it would lead to a visible uh, difference or separation between the elect positive charge center and the negative charge center. Now, when such a thing happens, it creates a uh, essentially a dipole moment. Now, let us look at what the situation is. Uh, supposing this is the situation, you have the positive charge center, negative charge center, they are the same. The, the, the electron cloud uh, overlaps in the atom with the positive charges and they, they, their centers coincide. So, that 
the net thing has a zero, zero dipole moment. Now, if you apply a, an electric field, it leads to a small separation between the two, but the electrons do not actually leave this atom. So, therefore, they remain bound to this atom, but if you look at their charge densities, there is a small separation between them. So, what actually happens is that this creates in this atom or molecule a dipole moment. This is this is uh, an, an induced dipole moment because it arises only when an electric field is applied. There are uh, examples of uh, dielectrics or non-conductors uh, where even in the absence of electric field there are charge separation. But let us look at that suppose I am looking at such a situation where I have applied no electric field, but if you look at the net dipole moment, net dipole moment that is total dipole moment of a combination that is equal to 0. So, let me explain this with a much easily understandable comparison. Uh, you take a piece of iron, now you know if you pick up a piece of iron from the uh, road, that piece of iron is not a magnet. Though iron is a magnetic material, that piece of iron is not a magnet. Now, the way one explains it is to say that the iron actually consists of a large number of small domains and these domains are in the absence of a magnetic field are randomly oriented. So, that the net vector sum is equal to 0 and I make the same statement here. If you look at this picture, you notice that I have given a collection of large number of dipoles. Now, if I do not have an electric field, then these dipoles even if they are permanent dipoles, these dipoles are not are randomly oriented giving me that the total electric dipole moment of this assembly is equal to 0. Now, what happens when you apply an electric field? Now, if I apply an electric field like this, the these dipoles will be persuaded to align fully or partly depending upon the strength of the electric field. Now, since remember I told you yesterday the direction of the dipole moment is from negative charge to positive charge. So, therefore, this is the way they would be oriented. And in the presence of an electric field therefore, I will develop a net dipole moment that of this assembly. Okay. So, this is a this is what is called a dielectric. Now, what I am now going to do is this that basically I have I have taken a collection here. This this is a, a random uh, piece of material uh, an insulator, but you see I have told you already that in the insulator if you look microscopically in small regions there might be dipoles there. So, let us look at how does one handle this problem. The way to handle this problem is the following that suppose I have a point P now this uh, and I choose some origin it does not matter where you choose your origin. Now, the uh, vector r is from this chosen origi origin to the point P and uh, let me take a small volume here uh, located at a distance r prime. Now, I am trying to find out now that how does one calculate the effect of the potential due to this volume element which may have charges or the dipole moments or whatever. Now, let us look at first remember that we are dealing primarily with Coulomb's law. So, it is very important to find out how does one handle 1 over r minus r prime in mathematics. Now, first let us look at that. So, 1 over r minus r prime this is a very important uh, thing particularly those who do nuclear physics they are very uh, much involved into it. So, what I do is this this is r prime and this is r. So, what is r minus r prime this is this distance. So, this is given by by triangle law r square plus r prime square minus 2 r r prime cos theta to the power half. Okay. Now, what I do is this that I am going to be going to assume that this distance r is much greater than this distance r prime. Now, if you do that then look at I do a binomial expansion of this. So, I have got 1 over r square plus r prime square minus 2 r r prime cos theta raised to the power half and so this is nothing but same thing and I do a binomial expansion assuming 
that r prime by r is small. If you do that trivial algebra, I am not repeating it, you get 1 over r, that is the first term, r prime by r cos theta plus r prime square by r cube 3 cos square theta minus 1 at dot 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 because I am not really interested in going further. Now, look at each term, this is what I wrote down and what I now do is I sort of put it in a slightly uh, more compact form. Uh, for instance, I supposing I define r dot r prime, I know it is r r prime cos theta. So, therefore, I multiply an r there in the numerator r r dot cos theta I have got. So, therefore, I, I get the, this uh, relationship that this should be square and then this relationship etcetera. Now, I look at the various terms that is there. I look at the various terms that is there in the expression for potential. Since I am only dealing with dipole, uh, the next term is incidentally called quadruple. I am not really at the moment interested in it, but let us just look at the first two terms. Now, if I look at the first two terms, now this is my potential because my potential is uh, rho r prime 1 over r, r minus r prime d cube r integrated over the volume. Remember my first term in the expansion was 1 over r. So, since I can take out 1 over r, this uh, integration is over r cube, first term in the expansion was 1 over r, so I have just taken it out. Now, if I have taken it out, I am left with integral rho r prime d cube r prime, this you recognize as the charge. So, the first term is simply q by r. Now, this is the potential that a point charge would have at a distance r. How does it come? It simply says, remember my uh, uh, definition was my r is much greater than r prime. So, what we are saying is, if your distances are very large, even if you are looking at distributed charge distribution, at large dist distances, it seems like a point. Of course, we know it. Any finite body, if you go far enough, it looks like a point. So, because of that, I have a Coulomb correction here, a Coulomb term here. The second term is this. You notice again, in the in the top, I had written r r prime, r dot r prime. So, again everything connected with r I take out. I am left with r prime rho r prime d cube r prime. You recognize this as nothing but the uh, uh, dipole moment of the assembly. So, the dipole moment term is rho r prime, this is charge multiplied with distance and so therefore, the corresponding dipole uh, factor is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 r dot p by r. So, this is the way one does the dipole moment uh, expansion. So, let us come back now and concentrate only on the dipole moment term and that is phi of r, there is an algebra, but I will go through it because of certain reason. So, phi of r is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Now, p r prime is defined as dipole moment per unit volume, it is called the polarization. So, this is, this is the expression that I have here. So, this is, this is the expression that I have okay? and so it is p r prime dot r minus r prime by r minus r prime cube and this we have done several times that whenever you have got r by r cube, you can write it as the derivative. Now, in this case, if I took the derivative with respect to r, I will pick up a minus sign, but I am doing derivative with respect to the integration variable namely r prime. So, there is no minus sign there. So, I got p r prime del dot gradient with respect to r prime d cube r prime. Now, this term I combine by using the uh, uh, chain rule differentiation. So, I said this is del prime dot this into this minus the scalar term out and del prime dot p. This is nothing but rearranging this term as del prime dot this into this minus this times del prime dot p, which is simply saying f uh, differentiation of two quantities is uh, a differentiation b plus b differentiation and that is all that I use. Okay. So, once I have used that, notice my first time was, first term is del prime dot p r prime 1 over r minus r prime. 
Now, this is divergence of a quantity integrated over a volume. So, therefore, this term by standard divergence theorem, which we have been talking about several times, can be written as the surface integral of this quantity p r prime dot n r minus r prime, this is a surface integral. And I of course, have a volume integral remaining there, which is del prime dot p etcetera. Now, look at these two terms for the interpretation purpose. So, in the first term, notice I have a 1 over r minus r prime and I have p dot n d s. This is that since it is surface integral, this is the type of term that you would get if you had a surface charge density sigma b. So, how do I define sigma b? Sigma b is nothing but the normal component of the polarization vector and the polarization vector I have defined as the uh, net dipole moment per unit volume. The second term here has a minus del prime dot p, but it is a volume integral. So, therefore, and again 1 over r minus r prime is there. So, therefore, this would be what I would get if there is a volume charge density. So, the original potential to the approximation that we have done has two terms. One is a surface term, I put a subscript b to indicate that these are bound systems. So, these are called bound charges. So, I have a bound surface charge density sigma b. What is sigma b? Sigma b is nothing but normal component of the polarization. Then I have a volume charge density which is bound which is rho b and what is rho b minus my rho b is minus del prime dot b. So, this is the bound volume charge density and bound surface charge density. So, these are the two definitions. Sigma bound, I am talking about bound charges because these charges are not flowing around p dot m. Rho bound that is volume charge density is minus del dot p, p is the polarization vector. Now, let us look at what happens to our uh, Maxwell's equation. Remember we proved that del dot of p is equal to rho by epsilon, but then my rho could have two components. I could have one of the parts for due to the free charges which are moving in, so rho free and another part due to the bound. So, I can write del dot of p equal to rho free plus rho bound by epsilon. Now, notice that I could define a new vector, which is I could define epsilon 0 del dot of p, right. I could define epsilon 0 e plus p. So, I suppose I define a vector d. Incidentally, though again do not ask me the nomenclature, because the nomenclature may be historical, but it does not mean anything. This vector d, in fact, physicists always call it, they call it vector d. The vector d is defined as epsilon 0 e plus p. Now, remember from here, this rho bound is minus del dot p. So, substitute minus del dot p here, take that to the other side, okay. multiply with epsilon 0 delta del dot e, take this term to the other side. You will be left with the new version of our uh, Maxwell's equation, which is del dot of d equal to rho free. What is this rho free? Now, the thing is this that we are assuming that there are bound charges in the system. Okay? Now, the and there are two charges in the system which are the rho free. Now, if you are only concentrating on the true charges, not the induced bound charges, then del dot of p does not give you the rho free by epsilon. But if you define a different vector, then del dot of d gives you that rho free. So, in other words, now, now mind you, uh, it is not very easy to make this separation. Not easy to make this separation because this is intuitive. This is you have to imagine how that if I subtracted out the bind bound charge, if I could, okay, then use the mechanism to calculate my d vector then my del dot of d would be equal to rho free. This is the way now our new um, different the Maxwell's equation would look like my del dot of d is equal to rho free and 
along with that I need my subsidiary definition what is d epsilon 0 e plus p. Remember e is the actual electric field which a test charge would actually experience. Now, let me see if uh, there are quick questions which I can take up and this is uh, silly goody again yes. I want to uh, ask you a question on uh, Laplace's equation. Yes. You taught me, taught us earlier. Yeah. Um, first, first thing, uh, del square phi equals to zero. That is the Laplace's equation. Right. So, what is the applicability of Laplace's equation? Suppose uh, you mean you, you have shown uh, two conductors separated by distance and placed in air medium. Yeah. So that is a charge free. Yes. So we can apply Laplace's equation to find out potential. Sure. But if we if we place dielectric material uh, in this parallel plate capacitor, yeah, uh, it's, uh, between two conductors, yes. sorry, two con parallel conductors. Right. So what's the situation? Del square phi equals to zero. Can we uh, use this Laplace's equation to find out potential, or we yes. use uh, Poisson's no, no. equation? See, since your solution, you are trying to solve the problem not in the dielectric but in the charge free medium. See the point is you, you are saying that along with my conducting plates I also have a dielectric there. Okay. Now if you are trying to solve in a region where there are no charges then of course the Laplace's equation is valid. So you can solve it but the problem is this with Laplace's equation that you know other than in you know I mean Nowadays of course there are many techniques of solving Laplace's equation particularly if you are interested in going to a computer these are packages which are available. But so the otherwise solving a multivariate uh, second order differential equation is not an easy task I mean you do not have analytical methods of doing it and that is the reason why we are trying to talk about subjects like method of image you know relatively simple problems which give us intuition about how to find it out. But the thing is this that first thing is is the Laplace's equation valid. Now, if the Laplace's equation is valid then of course all that you need now that you have to change the thing depending on the dielectric. If the dielectric is uniform and linear okay, then you can again make some approximations and do it. But, but if you have a general dielectric right, without any simplifying assumptions then it is not going to be easy. See, you, there is a there is a statement on in principle is it possible the answer is yes in practice it is possible the answer is no I mean uh, you have to then go to a computer there are no methods that I know which will be able to solve it but uh, I was planning actually to come to a solution of Laplace's equation using uh, some methods like you know we have some ways of doing it. So, let me take that up because you have raised this question let me take that up we will maybe in the next session you come back to your question again. Okay. Since uh, I uh, some of you have shown interest in solving Poisson and Laplace's equation uh, let me uh, repeat a few things that I said and try to solve it for some problems. Um, you realize that I always my starting point is this del square phi equal to rho by epsilon 0 that is Poisson's equation and del square phi equal to rho 0 that is my Laplace's equation in source free field. Okay. So, um, in addition of course, I am looking at electrostatic field. So, I have del cross of E is equal to 0. Uh, let me try to tell you uh, how to solve Laplace's equation um, in some specific cases. But first you need the expression for Laplacian. Now Laplacian in Cartesian of course all of you know del, del square phi by dx square dou square phi by dou square dou square phi by dou z square. Um, this is the expression in spherical coordinates. This is what I will be doing today. And this is the expression in cylindrical coordinates uh, one can do solutions there also. Now there are certain methods of solving these equations. So, let us look at that first. I have talked about uniqueness theorem. Basically the uniqueness theorem told me that if I have two solutions of Laplace's equation let us say phi 1 and phi 2. This is this is a region in which uh, I am looking at solutions in regions uh, let us outside us uh, 
and I have potential or the normal derivative of electric field given on various surfaces that are there. Then my statement was, uniqueness theorem statement was that the solutions are unique. I am not going to prove it again, we have done that last time. So, uh, I made a statement the one dimensional Laplace's equations basically are featureless equations. So, I gave an example for example, supposing you had one dimensional equation. So, what is one dimensional equation? d square phi by dx square equal to 0. The solution of that is mx plus c which is a straight line. So, therefore, you can find out supposing phi is given to be equal to 0 at x equal to 1, phi is given to be equal to 3 at x equal to 2, you can immediately write down that phi at any point x is nothing but the, the averages. I go to next dimension, this is of course, Poisson's equation and I told you that there is a feature in this equation. The Laplace's equation I told you does not have that interesting feature. That is, uh, you generally do not come up with a potential minimum or a potential maximum. For example, in this example, it is a saddle point. Let us come back to uh, in the next few minutes that I have a, a technique of solving Laplace's equation. So, I told you that uh, this is incidentally a technique which is useful even in Cartesian coordinates and that is del square phi is given by this expression. This is, this is the expansion of the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. Now, the standard technique of solving these equations is to do what is known as separation of variables. That is write phi which is a function of r theta and uh, phi as a function capital R of r, p of theta and f of phi. Now, substitute it here. Now, if you substitute it here, you realize that I can write it, uh, substitute it here, then divide things properly. Uh, this is, uh, well, I have used r r p theta f phi. If you do that, since d by d r takes only on capital R, d by d theta is only on capital P, d by d phi is only on capital F. Now, this is the equation that you get. Now, when you get this equation, then you say my left hand see the equation that you get is this plus 1 over f del, del dou square phi by dou phi square equal to 0. Then you say this is going to be equal to this. Now, this depends upon r theta, this depends upon phi. Now, since theta phi and r they can vary independently. How can these two things be constant? Same. They can be same if the left hand side is constant and right hand side is constant. So, you put that equal to constant. Now, if you put that equal to constant, you immediately get a solution for the azimuthal, which is e to the power i m phi. Put it back there, get back to the equation. Now, remember e to the power i m phi, I can find out what is m, because if phi goes around by 2 pi, then I must return back to f of phi. All right. In the same way now, I go to the polar equation, namely the theta equation. Now, when I go to the theta equation, once again, I say uh, by separation, I have left hand side, I have a function of r. Second, the middle term is a function of theta and they can be equal only if each one of them is a constant. For convenience, I put that constant not as some constant l, but as l into l plus 1. There is a reason, but it do not worry about it. So, my theta equation now looks like this. Now, this equation which you have got is a very well studied equation and what you do to study this equation is to substitute cos theta equal to mu. You do that, this is your equation and you can, mathematicians will tell you we have known this equation for years okay? and even physicists use this equation. This is the solution of this equation are known as Legendre polynomial. Okay. The Legendre polynomials, see the point is that these are already in standard mathematics texts. Now, so if I am given a standard equation, I do not try to solve it again, because if other people have solved it, I take borrow it from them. The solution of this equation are known as associated Legendre polynomial P and it properties that we have is P 0 cos theta equal to 1. P 0, P 1 cos theta is cos theta, P 2 cos theta is half cos 3 cos square theta minus 1 etcetera. And this is the way the picture looks like. So, this is your P 1. Okay? P 0 is of course, 1. So, therefore, that is here. P 1 is 
this is plotting against cos theta. So, therefore, it is a straight line. P 2 is this with a single minimum, P 3, P 4, this is the way the functions look like. I would in one of the sessions uh, where we take up uh, problems try to solve a very interesting uh, uh, case of conducting sphere in a uniform electric field using the method of Legendre polynomials. But at this moment I am running out of time, so therefore I would stop it here. Thank you.